No. All right, have a seat. Make your way back. Thanks, Levi, for those great announcements. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I feel, um, I said I feel really seen, and the Mark said, actually, I think you feel really attacked. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, my go-to um, for like a potluck always traditionally has been a, a bucket of KFC. Are you judging me for that, right? Maybe a little bit. Carrie's judging me a little bit. That's okay. I'm okay with that, okay? Um, also, when I was in Surrey for a while, I'd always bring a bag of samosas, which I think hits it at a certain level, right? It's pretty remarkable. Um, it's going to be great with a few, couple things. One, for a Good Friday, just to reiterate this, um, if you want to be part of a community group for, for a Good Friday, um, it's like a little bit different. It's experience in a house. Um, we want to build more intimate experiences this week, this, year, this week for Easter, um, and we'll partake in communion together. Um, that's why we kind of delayed last week for this coming Friday. Um, we have a whole service mapped out. So if you want to get connected into a community group just for one week only um, for Good Friday service, um, you can email me, um, colby at livefree.church, or you can come talk to me. That'd be awesome. This coming Sunday, this next Sunday, um, is our Easter Sunday. It's a great opportunity to invite someone. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt in the theater next door. Um, we'll have free lattes. Um, it's just going to be a, a huge celebration to celebrate that Christ is risen. Um, what a great day for us as Christians and a great way to celebrate and tell people around us why we celebrate Easter. Um, so those are kind of two things um, on our calendar. And then after that, we are launching community groups again. So if you like to be part of a community group, um, it's really, we talk about this all the time, it's like 10 to 12 individuals who meet for 10 weeks in someone's home to discuss the sermon. So it goes from like after Easter to the middle of June. And um, that's kind of the really our announcements. I'll pray and we'll get into this passage um, in Mark chapter 7, verse 24. So let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you reveal um, constantly to us how we should approach you, how we should follow you. Would our lives be marked by people who are changed by you? Maybe some people in this room have questions about you, have concerns, have doubts. But Lord, we bring those things to this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a friend of mine recently um, on, on Instagram posted that she was celebrating her son uh, being a year and a half old, right? And um, if you have little kids, right, parents do this very unique thing where they celebrate in months, right? And I said, thank you for not saying your son is 18 months old. The whole world collectively thanks you, right? And I was being sarcastic in that moment, right? But I think for, for my daughter is turning, has, is, has a birthday tomorrow, one of my daughters, and I'm not saying, I know, it's a great thing, right? Um, but I don't say for my daughter, I don't say she's going to be 96 months old tomorrow. <laughs> right? I don't say that. I don't say, you know, she's, she's turning eight tomorrow. I don't say happy 96-month-old birthday to my daughter, Evie. But she is 96 months old, which makes her sound so wise, right? But do you ever wonder how much time you have. Do you ever think about that? Like, have you ever thought about, like, how much time, you, when you think about, like, when you have a baby, like Jess and Steven, right, you, you calculate in, in weeks, and then it goes to months, and then after a while it goes to years. But there's a really famous book, just kind of, well, a New York Times bestselling book that came out just recently, and it's called 4,000 Weeks. And it's built on a premise that collectively we roughly have 4,000 weeks to live, right? And um, I was listening to a podcast where this guy was interviewed, um, and he was talking about how we need to start with the end in mind, if you think about that. If you have 4,000 weeks, which is, you can do the math on that, right? We don't have a lot of time to live. If you went and bought 4,000 ping pong balls and put them in a huge vat, and every single week you pull them out, after a while you'd be like, whoa, I have less ping pong balls in my little bucket of, of my life that I thought I did. You see, it's like, it goes back to Psalm 90 where, where Moses says, Lord, teach us to number our days so we may gain some wisdom. 
There is wisdom in being aware of the time we have. And so this guy's premise is what is the purpose of a life? A meaningful life is to live it to the full with the the weeks that we have. The 4,000 weeks, which some of you might be in the middle of those weeks, might be at the end of them, might be at the beginning of them. We're all across the map. But it shows us what we're looking for. What are you looking for? In those 4,000 weeks, is it love? Is it meaning? Is it significance? Is it friends? Like everyone in this room is looking for something different. Is it money? Is it possessions? Is it a good quality life? Like what are you looking for? But sometimes when people's weeks are cut short, when something happens, like a, a blip in the road where it's like, what happened to my 4,000 weeks? I had 4,000 and now I went to the doctor and I got a diagnosis and actually I'm actually going to have 2,500 weeks. I'm going to have less weeks than I thought I was going to have. You see, what happens to us in those moments where turmoil comes up or struggle or pain See, there's a passage in the Bible here in Mark 7, verse 24 to 37. And I want to talk about how do we deal with those 4,000 weeks when we struggle? But how do we deal with those 4,000 weeks when we encounter Jesus? How do we come to him? How do we come to him in our desperation, our brokenness? But I don't only want to think about how do we find Jesus, but how does he actually change us? See, if your Bible's... Go to Mark chapter 7, verse 24, and here's what it says here. It says, He got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know about it. He could not escape notice. Instead, immediately after hearing about him, a woman whose daughter, whose little daughter, had an unclean spirit, came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile. She was a Psychophoenician by birth. And And she was asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. But this woman, this Gentile, replied, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, Because of this reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. When she went back to her home, she found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Again, leaving the region of Tyre, he went by the way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee through the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had difficulty speaking and begged Jesus to lay his hands on him. So he took him away from the crowd in private. After putting his fingers in the man's ears and spitting, he touched his tongue, which is totally not COVID safe. Right, um, looking up to heaven, he sighed deeply and said to him, "That is, be open." And immediately his ears were open, his tongue was loosened. He began to speak clearly. He ordered them not to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more they proclaimed. They were extremely astonished and said, "He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak." You see, there's a first account. There's two accounts here. Total of miraculous points. Miraculous healings. But the first one was a woman who's a Gentile. And I want to kind of look at how do we approach Jesus? How do you and I approach Jesus in our brokenness, in our desperation? But how do we actually approach him all the time? You see, what's going on here? But there's something very significant about how we approach Jesus, which we could actually just skim over, gloss over. You see, Jesus is ministering in the regions of Judea, which is a Jewish territory, and he's doing incredible things, right? He just fed 5,000 people. In the next passage in Mark 8, he's going to feed 4,000 more. He's feeding people, actually about 20,000 before he fed. He's interacting with the Pharisees. He's doing all these remarkable things. He's just kind of crushing it, and people are coming to Jesus. It's going so well that the crowds keep on gathering, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and he's like, actually, i got to withdraw from a place outside of a Jewish territory. It's the first time in his ministry he does this, where he's like, I'm going to actually go to a spot where no one maybe knows me. No one's going to look for me. No one's going to understand who I am. So he's like, I'm going to go to a Gentile region, to a desolate place, 
to find some peace and quiet, to get some, some needed rest. You see, it's a very unique thing. He ends up in this place where he's looking for complete rest. Maybe I'll have it in this one spot in this house. But he doesn't. Because a woman hears about it, but not just any woman, a mom. <laughs> a mom who's desperate for a daughter. A couple years ago, I was at Universal Studios. In, in the lower level of the lot, if you've ever been there, um, there's like Jurassic Park, which is now Jurassic World. There's like Transformer Ride. And uh, I'm going to the washroom. As I walk in, I notice a little kid, like my daughter Evie's age, eight years old, kind of just wanders out. But like this child like did not look normal. It just looked like he's wandering. Like wandering, like he's lost. And I saw it, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I went into the washroom and, and uh, came out. And as I came out, I sat on the bench waiting for my friends. And the dad, the mom came to the dad and said, where is our son? And the dad says, uh, he was just with me. He's not with you. Uh, I have no idea where he is, Right? And the dad's like, well, maybe I'll go look. And he like nonchalantly just walks into the washroom. The mom, right? She's like, no, she runs in there. She's like yelling his name, right? There's like men in there. She's like, hey, son, are you in here? Where are you? She's like looking everywhere. She's like knocking on the stalls. She is frantic, right? At this point, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like this mom is just like beelining to, to really rescue her son who's lost. And so actually I saw out of the corner of my eye her son with a guy who's from Universal Studios. And I said, actually, I think I know where your son is. And she's, at this point, it went from like 10 seconds from like her rushing the washroom to actually her now hysterically crying. She comes over and she goes, you know where my son is? And I'm like, yeah, he's just right over here. So I'm like, I have no idea her name. I'm like, hey, here, I think this is your son. And she, as soon as she saw him, she's like hugged him and, and her and her husband were having some pretty crazy dialogue, right? But I think, you think about that, about the desperation of a mother, that Jesus is actually encountering a woman who's a mom, whose daughter's sick, who has a demon, who's an unclean spirit. If you go back and read the passage last week, it's all about cleanliness and uncleanliness. We're talking about this woman who boldly comes with an astonishing boldness and goes to Jesus and falls at his feet. You see, the, the remarkable thing, when you look at that, you and I say, well, okay, that's just a mom who's desperate. But there's a mom who understands who isn't a Jew by birth, is a Gentile. She was a pagan, not a God worshiper, right? She was a woman in that culture, which she didn't have as many rights as men, unfortunately. Her daughter had literally a nine clean spirit. In other words, she knew in every way she was unclean. She knew every way that she was disqualified to enter into Jesus' appearance or space. She was disqualified from approaching a moral, devout person, let alone a rabbi, a teacher like Jesus. See, even though she was on the wrong side of the tracks, on every racial, sexual, moral, cultural, social barrier, she did not care. You see, I think for us, we have to realize that desperation often leads to transformation. She goes into the house with an invitation. We're told she just falls down at his feet and she kept on begging in desperation and nothing would stop her. No one could stop her. It says in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 15, that the disciples tried to get her and push her to the side because they didn't want her to, to disturb Jesus. See, they couldn't stop her, they won't stop her, and she won't let anyone stop her. She, will take no, she won't take no for an answer. She's talking, she's pleading with Jesus without any interruption, and she's so bold. You see, you look at our culture, you look at maybe people who are cowards and there's heroes. We kind of we compartmentalize our culture. There's cowards and there's heroes, and there's everything in between, but then there's parents. They're never on that spectrum because if your child is in a car and going off a cliff, what do you do as a parent? 
anything and everything you can to get your child off that cliff. It doesn't matter whether you're timid or brazen, if you're quiet or you're bold. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks about you. If your child is doing something, you are going to sacrifice for that kid. It's irrelevant what people think about you. It's irrelevant about your cultural, socioeconomic standing. Parents think differently than people. That's what his mom's doing. She's desperate for her daughter, for transformation. You see, if you're a mom or your dad, your character, your personality is totally irrelevant. They'll do whatever it takes. You know, it's not surprising this mother is desperate and she's bold and willing to break all the barriers so her daughter might be healed. But Jesus then responds with this very kind of complex passage where he says here in verse 27, says, let the children be fed first because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You see, first of all, you're like, what does that even mean, right? Like, what an interesting passage, what an interesting really parable that Jesus brings here. So we live in a very canine-focused society, right? Like in Jesus' society, nobody went down to the store and bought their dog a sweater, <laughs> right? Like you go downtown, like Yale Town in Vancouver, there's more dogs than babies. We're just in a very canine-focused society, right? All the things you can buy for your dog, it's remarkable, like, you go to a coffee shop, and they only have, like, a spot for where you're, you can get a latte or a Americano, but you can also get dog treats. They have treats for your dogs. Like, we are focused in the society on animals, which is amazing. But in Jesus' society, they were not focused like that. See, Gentiles, who are people who are not Jewish, were often called dogs by the Jews because they're so unclean. It's an insult. You know, is this, we look at this, is Jesus insulting her. He's not. He's speaking in a parable. He's speaking in a story. Right? The word parable means metaphor or likeness. This is like that, what he's trying to say. So the key to understanding the fact that Jesus uses the word dog, really what he's trying to say here is that his purpose, his purpose is for the Jews. That his ministry eventually will be for the Gentiles. But what he's trying to say here is, you know how families eat. First the children eat at the table what they choose. In that culture, then the puppies, then their dogs. Then their pets. Right? Their pets in that culture, they ate from the table, scraps from the table. You see, you never feed your animals before you feed your children. That's what he's trying to say here. In Matthew, his gospel gives a slightly longer version. But what he's hinted at in verse 24 is that Jesus never left Israel in his whole life. He didn't go to Greece. He never went to Rome. He never went to North America. He didn't go to Asia. Like, he stayed in a specific spot because he had a specific mission to fulfill. He consecrated, he consecrated all of his entire ministry in Israel for lots of reasons, but he wanted to be a fulfillment of all of the prophecies, of all the laws. See, when he dies and he's resurrected, then he immediately says to his disciples, now go to all the nations. See, here's what he's trying to say to this, to this woman, this desperate mom. He's trying to say, there's an order here. He's kind of brushing her off a little bit. And it's the most amazing thing about Mark's gospel is that the, the woman who responds back to the, to the parables, the first is a woman. She responds back, understanding what Jesus was saying. She comes back and says, yes, Lord, but. Can you hear a desperate mom there? Have you ever seen a desperate parent with a child at the emergency? Yes, but have you done this? Yes, but have you tried this? Yes, but please, can we try this other means here? What she's saying is, yes, I understand that you're here for Jews only but eventually you're going to reach the Gentiles. She says, yes, but the puppies will eat too. 
The puppies will eat from that table. And I'm here for my puppy. I'm here for my daughter. She will not take no for an answer. You see, you have to realize how remarkable this is. That he has a challenge and an offer and she gets it and she, off, she accepts the offer. She responds to the challenge by saying, okay, I get you. I'm not supposed to be at this table. I'm not in the tribe of Israel. I don't have a Bible. I do not worship the God of the Bible. I don't know the Ten Commandments. I'm so unworthy. I don't have a place at this table and I accept it. You see, isn't that a remarkable thing? When you think about us, when we come to someone for something, usually we come on our own rights, right? I have the authority to be here, or I have the right to be here. I deserve to be here to ask for whatever it is. She comes knowing that she has no rights, that she couldn't earn it, she doesn't deserve it. She's not saying, I want mine now. She's wrestled with Jesus in the most respectable way. You see that? I, I, this is the thing about love this, this passage, where she's saying, the gospel will eventually go to the Gentiles. But would you maybe give me what I don't deserve? You see, she has like a rightless assertiveness. She doesn't know anything about what she really deserves. She knows what she shouldn't deserve. But she goes to Jesus like a laser beam and she completely accepts her unworthiness. And she says, I'm not coming here on the basis of my goodness. I'm coming on the basis of your goodness. On your goodness, Jesus. I will accept maybe your insult of me, but... I will not insult you by, by not treating you as mercy deserves. Lord, when I'm not saying to you, give me what I deserve on the basis of, of my goodness. I'm saying, give me what I don't deserve on the basis of your goodness and your grace. It says, I want it now. Give me what I don't deserve, would you please? See, there's a feistiness in this mom. There's an assertiveness there's a desperation that leads to transformation. And it kind of shows us, I think, ultimately how we come to know Jesus. One, you're desperate. You are so desperate. You have nothing else but Jesus. You know you have no right to stand on. You have nothing to bring to this. You're like, actually, no, I'm a pretty great person. Actually, no, I've done some pretty good things. The mom could have said, well, you know, like, I love my daughter enough to come here to this house to break down a door, kick it in, and say, Jesus, follow your feet and say, would you heal my daughter? She has no rights. That's how we come to Jesus. We, we know we're desperate. We have no rights. But you accept his love when you don't deserve it. You see, that is how we approach Jesus in desperate times. We know we have no way to earn it or deserve it. And yet Jesus sees us in our brokenness and gives us something we don't deserve. Then moves on the next miracle in the healing of a deaf, mute person. Man, it shows us that this is, or shows not this is the greatest miracle, what the greatest miracle is. You see, he left the vicinity of Tyre and went through another region but down to the Sea of Galilee into this region of essentially 10 cities. And they brought a man who could, was deaf and couldn't talk. And I want to see two things here where Jesus encounters a man. And what does he say? He sighs and he says, be opened. You see, what is all this about? That Jesus is this miraculous worker. That some of us in our 4,000 weeks, we would love for Jesus to stoop down and say, be healed. Would you have ears to hear, eyes to see? Maybe there's some medical issues. You see, we see here at one level, Jesus cognitively, he's cognitively identifying with this man. He's touching his ears, he's touching his mouth, he's looking to heaven. 
One commentator says it's like sign language. What Jesus is saying here is that he's empathizing with the person. You see, if you've been deaf and mute, there's some speech issues. He cannot produce proper speech, just growing up the way he was. Jesus takes him to a quiet place. He only sees him. He's touching his eyes, touching his ears. He spits and touches his mouth. But he takes him to a quiet place. You see, this man's been a spectacle for years. And Jesus sees him, identifies emotionally with him. With the outcast that he was. You see, Jesus didn't want to make this man a spectacle. He didn't want to make him a show. He didn't want to, he wanted to see how sensitive this man was to the fact that he was deaf and mute. You know, you see, this is very, for Jesus, emotionally, he's, he's identifying with this man. It says that he had a deep sigh. But in their translation, it says he actually moaned. A moan is an expression of pain. Now, why would Jesus be in pain? You see, it says here he, he emotionally identified with the man and his alienation and isolation. That because this man was deaf and he was mute, he was isolated and he was alienated from his society. And maybe you can resonate with that. But Jesus knows he's about to make the man the happiest person on earth. But Jesus is showing here, he's looking at the man. What he's saying is, wait till you see what I'm going to do for you. Wait till you see what I'm going to do for you that's better than new ears. And a loosened tongue. Speech. Wait till you see one day what I am going to do for you that's going to radically transform and change you. There's a word, a single Greek word that's used in this passage, in this, in this phrase, talking about this man. But the, it comes from Isaiah 35, verse 5. And Mark does this all the time. He throws in these rare words. And it, and it really kind of connects back. In Mark, there's no reason why Mark would have used it except if he's wanting us to cross-reference something and show us in Isaiah 35. In Isaiah 35, it's a prophecy of the Messiah. And here's what it says here. It says, God says, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with divine retribution. He's coming. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. You see, as I bring the band back up, I want you to understand this. The Mark saying here is that when you come in complete desperation, not knowing your rights that you stand on. You have no rights to come to Jesus. That's when you can accept his, his grace, his love. But you and I, in our 4,000 weeks, we want so many miraculous things to happen. Maybe it's like a child coming to know Christ. Maybe it's being healed from a condition, a medical condition. Maybe it's the miraculous feeling of one day buying a house. I have no idea what it is for you. But what he's trying to say here is that I might heal your ears or give you speech, but there's no greater miracle than me. That's what he's trying to say here. That God has come. That God's retribution is coming and he will save you and I. That's the greatest miracle. When people ask me all the time, Cologne has this, like, this prosperity vibe that people will say things like, well, you know, like, maybe God wants everyone to be healed. And I said, well, what about all his disciples? Like, Jesus is, like, the, really the most unsuccessful church planter of all time. Think about that. He starts with no one, ends up with 12, then ends up with 11. And that's when his church starts to take some traction. As disciples, as 11 mishmash people, tax collectors and fishermen, brothers, go out and through the power of the Holy Spirit do the work of Jesus. 
But you look at those disciples. There's nothing glamorous. Like Peter's not showing up in a Porsche. When I went to the Vatican, I did not see a Ferrari in the bottom of that. What I saw was a tomb. You see, the disciples gave their lives. They died. Poor, broken people who are filled with God's love and grace, his compassion and care. His disciples were desperate. They knew they had no rights to stand on. And they wanted deeply transformation that comes from constantly bringing yourself to Jesus. Let's pray. If you love for anything for prayer after the service, come, come forward. We'd love to pray for you. But I hope that Levi just leads us in a time where we can reflect on our own desperation leading up to Easter, that we would deeply desire more of Jesus, that our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors would all need Jesus in a profound way, that in your 4,000 weeks, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're desperate for, that you'd find Jesus and you'd find life. As John 10 says, life to the full. That you'd find healing spiritually you never knew you needed. The sin that you've covered up, you've masked. Would you come to Jesus and find life everlasting? Let's pray. Father, I pray we be we be people that are desperate like this mother whose daughter had an unclean spirit, a demon. And we'd do anything to come to you. I pray this week that we would desperately come to you over and over and over again. Not on our own rights. We don't deserve any of this, but you freely give it to us. And that's the gospel. Would we respond sing this out, that we are so loved in spite of ourselves, in spite of our circumstances. Lord, we want life everlasting, life to the full with you. Heal us, change us. Holy Spirit, convict us of our sin, our brokenness. Father, I pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit on these people right now. In Jesus' name, amen.